So I have this visceral memory of when I was probably, I don't know, 12 or 13. I came home from school and I was inconsolable and I saw my mom and I just was like, it's not fair. And I proceeded to tell her about um, what had transpired where I think what happened, I don't remember the exact details as much as I remember just my visceral sense of unfairness. Um, I think what happened is that our, my drama class had cast, our, our uh, teacher in our drama class had cast the roles in the play. And it was my senior year and I was sure I was gonna get the lead. I had memorized all the lines, I had, I had a good relationship with the teacher, I, had, I was better than the other people who tried out, in my humble opinion. You know, and I think that I had, I don't know, for whatever reason, I thought I had done all the right things. Well, I was not cast as the lead in the play. And I came home and I was just beside myself and expecting that my mom would give me all kinds of empathy. I'm sure she did, but what I remember most is her saying, yeah, honey, life's not fair. And I was like, what kind of a response is that? Like, and I kept arguing with her and, and finally I said, I remember saying this, I'm saying, but if it can be fair, it should be fair. And she just kept saying, yeah, life is, is not fair. And I, I just remember that feeling that some fundamental rule in the universe had been violated, that I had done, I'd played by all the rules, and yet I was suffering. And there was a person, namely my teacher, Mr. Smith, who could have made it different and didn't. And, you know, if I'm honest, that 12-year-old that self, that 13-year-old self, still, I still have that self in me sometimes that wants to cry out and say, it's not fair. And I wonder, you know, where, where does that come from? I don't, I don't remember anyone ever telling me, oh yeah, life, life is gonna be fair. I never, I never, I've never seen that written anywhere, I've never, I've never heard that, and yet I have that somewhere rattling around in my belief, and, and I'm not, I know I'm not the only one, right? Give me some sense of affirmation here. Yeah, exactly, I hear some Susan hand raised in the back. And you know, Elaine Pagels, the theologian, says that, that we, that this is in great, at least in Western culture, and particularly in US culture, the sense that, that there is, that, that we make meaning out of things, and particularly, we wanna make meaning out of hard things that happen, bad things that happen, suffering, especially if we think suffering is undeserved, which begs the question about whether suffering is ever deserved, but that's a separate sermon. Um, so we, we, we have this fundamental question, and, and we have such a sense that, that um, that the, there's a fundamental order to the moral universe that if you do the right things, you get good results, and if you do the wrong things, you get punished, that we would rather feel guilty for something that we know is not our fault, or blame somebody for something that can't possibly be their fault, than admit that maybe there is not, that the, that the world isn't fair, that there's not that particular truth in the moral universe. And for people of faith, this becomes particularly tricky because we attach this idea of God to this, to this notion of fairness. That if there is a God, of course a God who is all good and all powerful, because that's what makes God, how can there be suffering? How can there be evil that exists in the world? Which of course is the classic question of called theodicy. It's one of the basic questions in theology. And we want so much to believe that if we follow these rules, you know, that, that life will turn out. But of course, we know that's not true. We know that's not true in our own life. Innocent people suffer all the time. Bad things happen to good people. And quote unquote, bad people get rewarded. And so even though we long for that to be true, we know that it's not true. And this is not a question that is just a, a new recent phenomenon. This is that the book of Job in the Bible, this ancient book, takes on this central question of how is it that bad things can happen to a good person? And it deals with it head on, directly. Although perhaps not exactly clearly. One of the, um, I love the book of Job so much because I think it does deal with this fundamental um, issue of the human question, and I also love it because it's so mysterious. I think Job, more than any other book, 
in the Bible has, you know how if you have a study Bible, they have um, notes on the bottom? And like Job, more than any other book, has notations that say, Hebrew here, unclear. <laughs> and it's because in um, the middle part of the book of Job, there's more uh, Hebrew words in Job that appear only in Job and nowhere else in the Hebrew Bible than any other, than any other book. Which means that if there's ambiguity, they can't go to another book to think about wh what the context of that word is. Um, and so it means that there's, the book of Job has been interpreted in lots of different ways. And oftentimes the interpretation reflects more the theology of the interpreter than anything, any truth that's in the book, which is certainly going to be true in this sermon. So I um, encourage you to read it and decide for yourself. So Job, um, the other thing, interesting thing about Job is it's kind of two two books in one. It begins with the, the first couple of verses of this ancient fable that existed before the book of Job was written. And the author took this fable to begin. And it has the story of, of Job, a righteous man who lives a blameless life and has been blessed by God. Lots of kids, lots of cattle, very healthy, good wife. And it starts off with um, God and, and Satan, the accuser, having a, having a little sparring in heaven. And the accuser, and God says, look at Job. He's so, look, he's so righteous. And Satan's like, well, sure, because you're blessing him. Take away those blessings, and I bet he'll curse you. So God takes the bet. And um, slowly but surely, Job begins to lose his blessings or be cursed. His cattle die, his kids die. He has this terrible skin disease. And still, in this fable of Job, Job does not say anything against God. This is where you get the verse, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. And this is also where, in our popular mythology, we get the phrase, the patience of Job. Has anybody heard that? Like Job, the patient, the, the person who's, who is righteous and just suffers all these things from God without complaint and in the end is rewarded. That's, I think, in the public mythology. But what's interesting is that's actually not what the book's about. It starts with this fable, and it ends with Job getting all, uh, everything restored. But in the middle, it's, instead of prose, it's this incredibly rich, beautiful, complicated poem that is a story about Job, this person who was a righteous man, who lived a righteous life, who tried to play by the rules and did, who had terrible things happened to him. And his friends, his friends, no, his friends, they were friends, came alongside and get into this great debate with him to try to understand these basic questions or these basic premises that somehow don't seem like they can coexist. God is good. God is powerful. Suffering happens. So in this particular case, God is good. God is powerful. Job is a good guy. So they begin to like, okay, all three of these things can't really be true. because So they begin to talk about it. But what first is what happens is Job has everything um, that was good in his life taken away from him. And his friends hear his lament and they, and they come to him. And probably one of, the, one of the most significant parts of the book is it says that for the first seven days, actually what the friends do is they're just silent. They just sit with him in his grief, which, you know, maybe if it had stopped there, things would have been different. But after those seven days, Job himself, he just, he just can't stand it. He's been in his grief, and so he begins to lament, and he lets it go. And he begins by cursing the day he was born. I wish that I had never been born, and he curses the birth of all life. Well, his friends, who, who knows what they've been thinking for seven days, but they just, they just can't let that stand, and so the debate begins. And his friends begin to challenge Job. And they challenge him, and it goes on for a long period of time, but essentially, they challenge him, or they, and they provide, they're trying to provide comfort. And when I read the book, I feel a sense of chagrin, because these are some things that I say when I try to provide comfort. Maybe they feel familiar to you. They say things, some of these things I say, some of these things I don't say. They say things like, well, Job, you just, you have a really limited view. God has, has God's view, and I know it seems really bad right now, but it's, it's going to get better. 
You just have to hang in there and trust that in the end, God's gonna, we know that God is good and God is powerful. God will reward the just. And if you're really just, you'll, you'll, you'll be rewarded. And they also say, are you, are you sure you've really been so righteous? I mean, we all kind of deny and repress. So are you sure you didn't just kind of fall out of line in one place? And, and you're, really, you're really great. We know you are. But none of us are perfect. So, you know, we all kind of get punished and brought back in line. So, so maybe that's what's happening. And then, and then sometimes they'll say, well, I, maybe you're suffering. I mean, maybe you're overinflating your suffering. I mean, really? Is it, is it really that? So this is, and they, they continue this. And, and to these responses, every time they respond, Job maintains his innocence. He's like, no, I am suffering, and I'm going to continue to speak the truth of my suffering, and I have done nothing wrong. I have loved God. I have lived a righteous life. I... I don't understand what's happening. God, God is punishing me, and I've done nothing wrong. How can you say that God is good? Well, the friends, they hear this, they dig in their heels, and eventually what happens is that you find that they are more willing to throw Job under the bus. They're more willing to give up on, on their friend Job, to, to not believe the truth of what he's saying, than to give up on their theology. They're more willing to deny their friend than to somehow dismantle or challenge or take apart a theology that has been keeping them safe or making them feel secure in the world. And Job also digs in his heels. He is unwilling to give any ground on his, um, his experience. And so, probably exasperated with his friends, he takes it to God. And he demands God to show up and explain God's self. Interestingly, Job doesn't curse God, nor does Job ever challenge God's power. But he's definitely calling into question God's goodness. So he, he's, he's, you know, bringing this argument to God. It's like, where, where, come, and, come and judge me. I'm right here, God. Come and tell me what I did. So God responds in the proverbial whirlwind, or sometimes it's translated the tempest, but a violent storm. And, and as I said, this book's been translated in lots of different ways, and my favorite is actually a translation by a poet named Stephen Mitchell. It's like, so I really commend this book to you, The Book of Job by Stephen Mitchell. It's, be, it's, it's beautiful. Um, I have it, if you want to borrow it from me. So I'm going to read, it's a very long, God responds. I mean, I think God's probably just been patiently waiting, and so when God has a chance to respond, he responds over four chapters. I'm not going to read you all of that. But I am going to read you a, a, a portion of it. And I invite you, if you want to kind of, if you want to, to close your eyes and take this in, or to kind of get, let your gaze soften, and really imagine this. Like Job has been, Job and his friends have been sparring back and forth, arguing about this. Job is just feeling totally exasperated, is going to God saying, account for yourself. Explain how this can happen. How you who have all power and are supposed to be good can allow this to happen to me, a righteous man. Then the unnameable answered Job from within the whirlwind. Who is this whose ignorant words smear my design with darkness? Stand up now like a man. I will question you. Where were you when I planned the earth? Tell me if you are so wise. Do you know who took its dimensions, measuring its length with a cord? Where were you when I stopped the waters as they issued gushing from the womb? When I wrapped the oceans in clouds and swaddled the sea in shadows? When I closed it in with barriers and set its boundaries saying, here you may come, but no farther. Here shall your proud waves break. Have you ever commanded morning or guided dawn to its place to hold the corners of the sky and shake off the last few straws? Have you walked through the depths of the ocean or dived to the floor of the sea? Have you stood at the gates of doom or looked through the gates of death? Have you seen to the edge of the universe? Speak up if you have such knowledge. Where is the road to light? Where does darkness live? Perhaps you will guide them home or show them the way to their house. 
you know since you have been there and are older than all creation? Who cuts a path for the thunderstorm and carves a road for the rain to water the desolate wasteland, the land where no man lives, to make the wilderness blossom and cover the desert with grass? Do you know all the patterns of heaven and how they affect the earth? Do you hunt game for the lioness and feed her ravenous clubs when they crouch in their den impatient or lie in ambush in the thicket? Do you teach the vulture to soar and build her nest in the clouds? She sits and scans for prey far from far off. Her eyes can spot it. Her little ones drink its blood. Then the unnameable asks Job, has God's accuser resigned? Has my critic swallowed his tongue? Job said to the unnameable, I'm speechless. What can I answer? I put my hand on my mouth. Then the unnameable spoke again from the whirlwind. Do you dare deny my judgment? Am I wrong because you are right? Okay, dress yourself up like an emperor. Climb up onto your throne. Unleash your savage justice. Make the proud man grovel. Pluck the wicked from their perch. Push them into the grave. Throw them screaming to hell. Then I will admit that your own strength can save you. And now look. Look. Look at the beast that I have made. Look, the power in his thighs, the pulsing sinews of his belly. His penis stiffens like a pine, his testicles bulge with vigor, his ribs are bars of bronze. He is the first works of God, created to be my plaything. Who then will take him by the eyes or pierce his nose with a peg? And what of the creature, the serpent? Will you catch the serpent with a fish hook? or tie his tongue with a thread? Will he plead with you for mercy and timidly beg you pardon? Who under all the heavens could fight against him and live? Smoke pours from his nostrils like a steam from a boiling pot. Power beats in his neck and terror dances before him. When he rises, the waves fall back and the breakers tremble before him. He makes the ocean boil lashes the sea to a froth. No one on earth is his equal. He is king over all the proud beasts. At the close of God's words, Job said, I know you can do all things, and nothing you wish is impossible. I have spoken of the unspeakable and tried to grasp the infinite. Before, I had heard of you with my ears, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I will be quiet, comforted that I am dust. Then the Lord turned to Job's friends and said, I am very angry at you because you have not spoken the truth about me as Job has. For Job's sake, I will overlook your sin because it is Job that has been truthful, not you. The word of the Lord. So, Job got a response. Not really an answer. More like questions. Right? Where were you when I created the world? Are you the one that makes the morning rise? What about the lioness who needs to kill in order for her young to eat? Are you feeling sorry for the prey? What about those cubs? And, and really, Job, do you want me to take, me, God, to take your view of justice and project it out into the universe? Are you so confident that your idea of justice, that we can project it out the way you want to treat those who have violated your standards? And what about the beast? and the serpent. Also, the Leviathan and the Behemoth, 
these ancient creatures in Near Eastern mythology that represent sort of um, sexual energy, maybe eros, and chaos. God says, I, I created them too. Do you, I can't even... I can't even control them. You, you want to try and control them? Would you even want to? Now, as I said, there's lots of ways to interpret this, and, and there's definitely a line of interpretation that says that what God was saying to Job was like, I'm God, you're not, get over it. And I actually don't, I think that that, one, I just, I just think that's such a non-generative theology, of like our, about who God is and our relationship with God and even what humanity is about. But even in the text, it doesn't make sense to me because at the end of this whole speech, Job, you hear God say to Job's friends, you, I, I don't, I'm angry with you because Job was the one who was speaking truth. And, and that, that, that voice of God saying, I'm God, you're not, shut up, that's, that's kind of more what the friends were sort of saying. And in the text, God's saying that's not... That's actually not the truth. Job spoke the truth. I think if we, if we have anything at all from this text, we see that, that God, that the author of Job is saying that God longs for us and wants us and affirms us to be honest about our suffering, to speak the truth of our life, to believe our experience and to believe the experience of someone else who is suffering that rather than keep us, that propel us away from God or have that be something that God abhors, that that's what, that's God, that's what draws the whirlwind to Job. That God is becoming towards Job to engage with Job because of Job's honesty. And the, the beautiful thing about the text is that we can't, those of us who don't read Hebrew, it's hard to see, is that the way in which God is described, the name for God changes in the whirlwind than it is from the rest of the text. The, the, all the other chapters that have gone before, God has been, the name for God has been El Shaddai or Elohim, which are very formal, um, respectful kind of names for God. And in the whirlwind, the name for God changes to Yahweh, which is the intimate name for God. It's the, God, it's the name that was used in the burning bush. So I think, you know, there's, the message is not that somehow we're going to be smited if we speak our truth, especially when that truth is, is about the suffering that we're experiencing. No, I think that there's a, a different message there. I think, I wonder if, if God might be saying, well, you know, I think, I think God doesn't, he's not actually arguing with Job's points. Job says God is powerful. God is saying, yeah, I'm powerful. I created the universe, including the serpent and the beast. God is not saying that Job is wrong in his, in his suffering. He's like, yep, you're speaking the truth. And to the question about whether God is good, God presents the universe, the beauty and the heartbreak, the order and the chaos. The energy that creates life, that messy energy of eros that is both the passion at the heart of things and also can cause havoc. And the serpent, the, the creature of the ocean, the, the chaos that provides um, stimulation and energy and confusion and danger. God says, yeah, I am in all of that. And you, Job, you, humanity, you are free. You are free. You are free. I made you free to engage in that world as you like, to step into that energy and use it for good or for ill, and I won't control you, but I will be with you. So Job takes all that in, and he says, I see that you have power and presence that I can't even fathom. Hm. I'm content being immortal. I am at peace. Peace. 
God is good. God is powerful. Suffering is real. Maybe those things, all three of those things, can be true and coexist. And we get to be free, free to choose to be good, free to choose to engage with those energies to alleviate suffering, to come alongside our friends, to work, to have, create more justice in the world, free to do that in partnership with God, not because we do that so that we won't be smited by a God, but because we get to be part of God's creative, loving energy when we choose that. I have heard of your goodness, O oh God. I see the wonders of your universe. I will be silent, content to be immortal. Thanks be to God. <laughs>